Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxim, this is Greg Ettinger, and today we're talking about theology proper, uh, specifically the unity of God. But first, let's start off with some introductions. Greg, I know you as a Bible teacher and a chemist and a director of stage plays and a Marvel fan. How's that for a summary? Well, I'm a DC fan on occasion, too. Uh, chemist is generous. I do teach chemistry, algebra, calculus, Latin, history, literature. In short, I'm a teacher at a very small Christian school where everybody does everything, <laughs> which is where I met you and your beloved husband, David. And I am also an elder in the Reformed Church in the United States. And I've been a Bible teacher for 40 years or so. And those are some of the high points. I like Agatha Christie more than I love comic books. There you go. Tell us about yourself, Emily. Uh, I am a former teacher's apprentice at said small private Christian school. I hope to return someday, but I currently am a housewife in the D.C. area and spend my time reading theology and trying to read other things and failing. And your husband is? My husband is our producer, and he is a computer science researcher. So I don't understand what he does for a living, but he <laughs> seems to enjoy it very much, and that makes me happy. Moving into our topic for today, you mentioned recently that uh, the simplicity and singularity of God have been coming up in your work as a Christian educator. How has that been most recently? The idea of education presupposes some kind of unity. No unity, nothing to pull the pieces together. You know, it'd be easy enough to jump to the Trinity and say three and one, but we need I think we need to nail down the oneness before we get to the threeness. The Bible introduces the Trinity in Genesis one, but it does this subtly and it takes a long time, four thousand years before it really begins to explain in any kind of theological detail what that's all about. But it gives us the unity of God over and over again from the beginning. And, uh, of course, that's not an accident. God knows what he's doing. So as Adam and Eve looked at their environment, they had to know there's one God, one mind, one truth, one wisdom, one love, one power behind all this, or they'd be completely at sea. And when Satan challenged God's reign, it was precisely at this point, yeah, this Yahweh person claims to be a god of some sort, but you too could be gods. There's lots of gods. There's gods, plenty gods all over the place. Or to put it differently, God has many faces where everything's kind of divine. Everything is actually a potentially God, and we can just dig in, tap into that divinity common to all of us, wouldn't the world be a wonderful place? We would be as gods, knowing good and evil ourselves. So given that as a challenge, let's talk about the unity of God. God, uh, theology proper, that's the part of theology that says, let's talk about God as he is in himself. Speaks of the unity of God in two ways, of God's singularity and his simplicity. Singularity is easy. There's only one God. God does not, not have competitors. There's no one. When he made the world, there was no one beside him to kibitz, give advice, make suggestions, exert other influences. It means that everything within creation came from the heart and mind of God. And, and so the world is exactly what God means it to be. When James at the Council of Jerusalem says, known unto God are all his works from the beginning, he simply means God knows everything because he planned everything. God, Not that God knows his part, but he's not too sure about everyone else's part, and he's making this up as he goes. It means that God alone is the creative source of all that is history, that is matter, that is space and time. He's sovereign. He is the one who has the plan and who executes it flawlessly according to his good pleasure. And that we sort of understand, whether we like it or not, we sort of understand that the Bible says that. I, I think that the simplicity of God is something we don't talk about as much, and it's something that has come up for me a lot lately, maybe simply because I understand it better than I used to, uh, and thus resort to it more. When we talk about the simplicity of God, we're saying very simply that God has no pieces and parts. 
He's not partly this and partly that, partly here and partly there. He's not sort of love, but also kind of justice. Uh, I think often when we talk about God, and I've been guilty of this, we, we think of a sort of Mr. Potato Head, where the potato <laughs> is the essence and being of God, and then we plug into that divine potato the attributes of omniscience, the eyes, um, um, the presence, the hands. Um, the angry the, eyes that we the angry just in case. <laughs> The angry eyes, yeah, that I suppose would be his wrath. The big smile would be his love. In other words, the attributes are distinguishable from the divinity itself. And this being so, we can prioritize the attributes. Some are more God than others. Some are more popular than others. Uh, we, we, we can slice and dice God to make him fit our predilections. The French fries of God. <laughs> for trots of God, yes. Slice God into, and fry him up into what we like in him. And this, of course, is simply idolatry. But if we do it carefully, even we don't notice what we've done. And it simply passes for uh, doing giving scripture its due. Well, God's, God's clearly love. Yes, he is. He's clearly truth. Yes. And justice and anger and wrath and holiness. And you go down on and on through the list. At list, there's a thought. And I think we <laughs> talked about this the other day. Um, the, the systematic theologies tend to make generic lists of the attributes of God. And I don't think any of the theologians have actually said, and this is all there is. I hope not. <laughs> that would seem to be exceeding unwise. <laughs> <laughs> you would think. But the same groupings seem to come up a lot. We talk about uh, his moral attributes, and we we specify benevolence and holiness, and you know, there 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 are a few things. And and, and as I over the years, as I've read through the standard systematic uh, theology books, I began to notice that there were some that were missing. Well, for the first thing I think that I caught was God's sense of humor. And God certainly has a sense of humor. One, we have one, and we had to get it from someplace. And unless it is, in its essence, inhuman, then it had to come from God. And I think we, we would all agree on that without much difficulty. But as you read through Scripture, there's a great deal that's humorous if we take away the stained glass spectacles we look through and actually look at what God's saying. And then someplace along the line, I noticed the really obvious big one, creativity. Hmm. Yeah, we talk about his power and his wisdom, but somehow we don't put them together and say... And, and, and add to that his aesthetic sense, his love of beauty, his ability to create beautiful, wonderful new things out of nothing, his imagination, well, maybe that goes into decrease, but we never say it that way. And I think there's a real problem with that. I think it uh, tends to shut us up into boxes where we preconceive what God is and can be while, while ignoring some very obvious things that he must be. Uh, and, and as a Christian educator, this is concerning. Uh, let me tirade about uh, Christian education for a second. It is very easy for Christian school teachers to get this fixed idea of what the Christian religion is like and what a good Christian student ought to be like. And we dial in a certain percentage of holiness, a certain percentage of justice, a certain percentage of hatred of the world, a very low percentage of uh, creativity, rather high percentage of intelligence. And then we, then we say, that's what a Christian school student ought to look like. And then we try to make everyone like that. Mm -hmm. And that's horrible. Uh, if Christian school teachers should be anything, we should be people who are alive to the great fullness that's God and not uh, limit ourselves to our narrow precon preconceptions, whether they come from our own experience, our own reading, our uh, denominational background, uh, the friends we hang out with, we, we need to read widely, experience widely, talk to all sorts of people. We, we, we need to see the beauty, wonder, and diversity of God's Word. And we're going to get there when we talk about the Trinity, perhaps a little more. But just as we look at God, we have to understand that there is a, an overflowing fullness in who he is. And all of that is God. It's not, well, we'll, we'll, we'll put in 10% of creativity, 5% of beauty, 1% of humor for those of you who insist on it. But really, let's get back to the justice or the grace or whatever it is that we really want to talk about and that God talks about the most. I suppose we could probably argue that some things are more crucial to our justification and sanctification 
uh, than others. But that's not the same thing as they're more so saying they're more important to God. Uh, God God magnifies perhaps some of his attributes a bit more in Scripture because Scripture comes to us saying so much about how we need to be made right with him. That brings us to how important it is that we look to Scripture for these attributes, not only for what they are, but as a list, but as their essences. Like we don't want to take hmm. beauty, as I've seen happen, and say, well, then yeah, everything that I think beautiful is God. It's like, no, we need to be looking at what Scripture says about God and his beauty. And God gets to decide what beauty is and what love <laughs> is and what wrath is and all these things. You mean beauty is objective? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm a more than a little annoyed at um, certain movements within Christian education that pander to truth and beauty. And what's the other one? Goodness. Yeah. The good, the true, and the beautiful, which is a really Hegelian term, right? <laughs> and a very Platonic one at that. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't seem to realize that it's these are not abstractions. Well, there's Plato. Um, to which all men are grasping with some degree of success. But as you say, that God himself has to define these things for us in Scripture, and that our first priority is to read the Bible, uh, both for what it says, just to enjoy, as you say, lists of, of divine attributes, but also for how God reveals these attributes. What, what does it mean for God to love? There, there's what we could go on about for a long time. Mm -hmm. This generation is so obsessed with love. Okay, that's good. God is love. Yes, he is. So God loves everybody. Okay. And that means he accepts everybody just as they are. Uh-huh. And would never change anybody under any circumstances. Right. Uh, so that's how we should be too. The number of logical fallacies I just committed are beyond number. <laughs> but if we would go back to John 3... 15, 16, 17, Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. God, in like manner, loved the world, and that he gave his only begotten son so that those who believe may be saved, and it was God's intention to send his son into the world to save the world. That redefines love for us by showing us the greatest act of love that God ever performed and the limitations he puts on it and the methods he used and what other attributes most obviously feed into this giving of his son as a sacrifice to atone for sin. So we're back to, yes, let's go back and read the scripture. Let's understand what God says about himself. Uh, in our practice run, one of the points I made, and I try to keep on making it, you've kind of already made it for me, maybe you just flat out have, is that we have to keep coming back to the very words of scripture. I, I love systematic theology, and I am devoted to the concept, and I am thankful for the men who've written the books. That said, when we start preaching and teaching from the systematic theologies or from our confessions and creeds, as important as they are, to the point that we're not actually exegeting scripture, we're going to have a problem. We're going to distort scripture, distort truth, because we're not teaching out of scripture. We're simply starting with our own point and then alluding to scripture to fill things in. It's very dangerous. Mm -hmm. So this is why all good Reformed Presbyterian preaching ought to be, in some measure at least, exegetical and exposition tied to the, the very words mm -hmm. of scripture. Yeah. And there's a difference between exegeting the scripture and preaching through a book, right? Like I've heard a lot of sermons in my day, as short as my days have been so far. <laughs> but there's this tangible difference as a member of the congregation when a preacher is well a pastor is being a pastor and walking his flock down the road that he took to better understand the word of god as opposed to having a sermon series that goes through these verses chronologically and talks about whatever reformed doctrine you want to talk about <laughs> like there's just a world of difference in the comfort and the edification you receive as a member of the congregation i think would you define those two again for me more closely i i, I laughed at what you said because it sounds so familiar but i'd still like a little clearer <laughs> delineation between the two sure in in the one instance you have a, a pastor say doing a sermon series on a book of the Bible. Um, and every 
week in church, you read the next section of text, and what the pastor's preaching could be from any other text of the Bible. Like he's using it as a jumping off place to talk about what he wants to talk about, um, which could be, you know, perfectly doctrinally sound, but it's not what that text is teaching us. Right. And so to have the other kind of preaching where you're actually coming to stand under, understand the text, but you're, you're putting your mind, soaking it in it and mm -hmm. coming to understand it better and showing the congregation how you've done that so that they come away with a better idea of how to understand the scriptures for themselves. Yeah, so they're not just hearing, again, what this text says properly, but they're also seeing and learning the process so that they mm -hmm. can take not only today's message home with them, but the very process and learn to think that way. And then this is huge, as you know, the little school we keep talking about ministers to people from all kinds of church backgrounds, and that's a wonderful thing. We have no problem with that. It's great. But many of the kids, and even some of our teachers who come to this ministry, uh, have a very different background where they're not used to thinking through a text. They're, they're used to the other that you describe, where the pastor will use a text as a jumping off point if he uses a text. Some um, seem to talk about whatever is on their minds and may perhaps reference scripture. And, and sadly, sometimes they don't even do that. So yes, we want to know what the text says. We want to know what the text says in context. Uh, and ultimately, the context is the whole book. Having said that, I think it's also good to, to realize that not every single sermon has to be part of an exegetical series through a book. Uh, I remember back when I was in college, uh, some students who were taking theology classes in, in this uh, Christian school were sort of, well, they were flat out saying, I don't know if their teachers would have approved or not since they never sat in the classes, but they, they were saying, in essence, you can't exegete a single passage or a single verse without having done the entire book, because if you do that, you lose context. I don't believe that's true. Uh, it is true that every text does hang in the context, and if you're going to talk very much about a passage, you probably should go back and, and see the chapter and the larger section and the book and which testament you're in and, you know, all of that. True. But the, the apostles and prophets regularly reference a particular passage, verse, phrase, clause, sentence, and they're not tearing out of context, but they are saying, you know where this is from. Go back and read it. Look at the context yourselves. I can quote it assuming you have the maturity and know your responsibility to find out how the original writer used it. And we can go on from here. I don't have to backfill every single thing, and I don't have to teach through an entire book before I can get to the sixth chapter, verse 7, and use it. So I want to, I want to be careful about that. So are topical sermons all right? Yeah, certainly. But, of course, the danger is that if that's all you do, the pastor will talk, as you say, about the things he likes most and his favorite rocking horses, and there will be a lot of scripture he will never share with his congregation and, and never challenge himself with. Mm -hmm. uh, I have heard Reformed and Presbyterian, certain Reformed and Presbyterian pastors uh, charged with never preaching anything besides the, the, the five points, the covenant and infant baptism. I don't know that that's true, but if it is, it's horrible mm -hmm. because there's so much more in scripture to talk about. And I think you can have a topical sermon that does preach in an exegetical fashion. Sure. Like you can be talking about one thing, but you're still walking through the scriptures to see how you got there. Right. And so thus, thus the importance, I don't even know how we got on this tangent, but it made sense at the time. <laughs> uh, the importance, oh yes, of letting God explain himself to us mm -hmm. uh, as we read through the whole of scripture and not just bits and pieces. Uh, there was a, a gentleman who taught at our school. I think he was way before your time. David, you might. Do you remember Mr. Henry? David? I remember you, Mr. David's Henry. David's nodding. Oh, you do? Oh, all right. Yeah, well, he he went to my church. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Henry, Keith Henry, was a wonderful, godly man. He was a quadriplegic who, before he had come to Christ, had injured himself in what he would have described as a really stupid diving accident. Uh, laying there in a creek, having fallen and broken everything, he turned to Christ. And he spent the next several years going through churches that emphasized the New Testament. 
And that he, and he would tell us later that gave him a very slanted idea of who God was, not so much because these churches taught the the New Testament, but because they did not understand the New Testament with the old as its foundation. They approached the New Testament as if it had no foundation, and thus they read their own ideas and opinions into it. And what Keith encountered, he told us, was a God of love and grace and goodness who obviously was willing to, to heal him any time as soon as he had the faith because, you know, look at the book of Acts, healings abound. And it was not, he said, until he came to our school and began to see the whole Bible that he began to realize that's not all there is to God. And the God he, he knew, he didn't really know. He knew the real God, but he was being told things that were only half-truths and that were not the whole truth about God. He came to understand the sovereignty of God and the greatness and glory of God. And, and in the end, he was quite willing for God to heal him if he wanted to, but he was also quite willing to accept the wisdom and love of a sovereign God who might not heal him. Uh, but that's a, a, another practical example of what happens if we limit ourselves to this part of Scripture, that part of Scripture, and don't read the whole Bible. Don't study the whole Bible. Don't exegete the whole Bible. Uh, we, this is something, if we're going to understand God, he gave us a book. we got to read the whole thing. And we have to keep reading the whole thing. We have to keep looking at the things that are uncomfortable to us and things that we don't understand, that don't make sense. And sometimes we put them on, on uh, tent pegs and our whole hooks on the wall and say, yeah, I don't get that. I'll come back to that. And, and it may be months or years before we come back and then we suddenly say, wait a minute, that fits right here. Oh, how was I so stupid? Well, it's that unbelief and an experience and all that. But we keep working at it. And so, again, back to the overall theme, Christian education, Christian worldview, Christian civilization, culture. We have to understand our starting point is a single God who is himself unified in what he is, or we, in effect, immediately devolve into some kind of polytheism where you like God's wisdom and he like God's justice and I like God's love. And pretty soon we find ourselves saying things like, well, my Jesus wouldn't do that. Which Jesus would that be exactly? And what are we supposed to do with that? Presumably not argue theologically or exegetically, mm -hmm. or we wouldn't have gotten to this impasse. And we're sort of look, sort of left glaring at each other because your Jesus doesn't measure up to my Jesus in some specific way. We're back to polytheism. So mm -hmm. the simplicity of God, the unity of God, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And before Moses gives us what's often called the charter for Christian education, the command to love God with all our hearts, to hide his word in our hearts, and to teach them diligently unto our children, he starts with that, the Shema, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's that's foundational for education, culture, civilization. So you called that the Shema. Um, you want to give some background on why that's called the Shema? Well, Shema is the Hebrew word uh, for here. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. Uh, these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and talk of them when you go by the way, and lie, rise up, and sit down, and so on. Bind them upon your uh, hand as frontlets between your eyes, write them on your gateposts. Don't have the whole text memorized, unfortunately. The summer camp that I went to as a high schooler, um, every morning and evening we'd gather at the flagpole to, you know, find out what we're doing that day. And we'd say the Pledge of Allegiance, and we would say the Shema. And the tradition that we had, I don't know how old this is, but we would have our pinkies up because the idea is God created the entire world with his little pinky. What could he do with his whole hand? <laughs> I don't know why we do that while we say the Shema. I, I have never heard that before, and I don't know either. <laughs> <It's interesting. laughs> but at least you said the Shema. Mm -hmm. um, or the Apostles' Creed, or the Nicene Creed, or something that testifies to who this God is that we love and serve. I am nervous when Christian classrooms start with the Pledge of Allegiance, but mm -hmm. they're hesitant to define the God they pray to. I don't know how common that is, but I have seen it. Yeah, the Pledge of Allegiance, honestly, has made me uncomfortable for some time. Like, uh, yeah, how vague is it? <laughs> yeah, it was originally written by a socialist, so, and the original form of the salute more looked more like Heil Hitler than it does with the hand over the heart. Anybody who doubts this, go and look it up on... Wikipedia, and you will find the appropriate information and pictures, and yeah, they're accurate. That is really how it started. Uh, a time when we needed national unity, and this was supposed to provide it. 
Oh, wow. We've talked about the unity of God, and I suppose now we need to talk about his triunity. And as I said, one of the reasons we talk about the unity first is we, we, we need that as a background, because otherwise the temptation is to say, not a problem. We have one God, and he's got these three parts. That's partialism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, be sure to include that little video in the show notes. Partialism, Patrick. Uh, Lutheran satire. Look it up. But it's, 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 it's one of the normal carnal responses of the human heart. We want to bring God down to a level where we can understand him. And so God's one, God's three. Well, that's easy. The, the two most obvious ways of dealing with that that are thoroughly unbiblical is one, to divide God into three parts or three members of this club we call God, <laughs> where the unity is in a sense superficial or at least not so as extreme as to exclude three separate personalities within the unity. Or, on the other hand, the threeness simply becomes one of um, title or phase or operation, job description. Uh, one of my students told me, this happened to her not too long ago, she was in some kind of retreat, I guess, and a young man was there who was new to the gospel and asked the pastor, well, can you just can you explain the Trinity to me? I don't get it. He said, "Oh, it's easy. Yeah, it's just like I'm, I'm a father, and I'm a son of my father, and I'm a husband. See, I'm three in one." That's modalism. <laughs> That's modalism, Pastor. Patrick. Patrick. Yes, I don't know the rest of the context, and um, well, what is the word when you benefit of the doubt, Christian kindness, all that. Uh, suggests that we assume that the pastor simply assumed the young man couldn't handle a full description at this point. It was just showing that there are ways that things can be three in one. But even so, that's really not very helpful. Uh, and again, Lutheran satire, Sir pa St. Patrick's heresies. King St. Patrick in this little cartoon finds out that trying to be too simple never works well. And it's better simply to tell people the truth and let them exercise their God-given faith for the gospel's wrought in them. And to challenge their God-given intellect. I mean, how many people have yeah. turned away from a Christianity that was shallow and, you know, not challenging because it wasn't, you know, it's, it can't explain the world. There's n no challenge here. It's very simple and down to earth and absolutely useless. And absolutely useless. The, the interesting thing about man is apostasy. He wants God to be understandable. And yet if God's understandable, well, then that's not worth my time. <laughs> so we're caught between a pagan idea of transcendence, of, co of being incomprehensible, and being comprehensible at the same time. Now, there's a Christian doctrine that allows that, but the pagan doctrine is, no, God must be so absolutely honest that we can't even talk about him or communicate him about, uh, about him meaningfully. He must be wholly other. We get the God, <laughs> God of Karl Barth or Emmanuel Kant. And then we, or Arius, or then we try to bring God down to our level so that we can understand him and say, see, Trinity, it's easy. I can explain that. And neither one satisfies the intellectual cravings of the human heart, but neither will the truth until God grants faith. We will continue to say that's too hard or that's too simple, or that just so offends me on all levels. Being ashamed of the Trinity, being nervous about the the faith it requires does not help us. It does not help us to say, let's not talk about the Trinity because that makes us look kind of foolish. Let's just talk about the oneness of God. And we can talk about the Trinity somewhere down the line. That's not what this world needs. The world needs to know the real God. We, we've, we've got all kinds of monotheistic gods out there. And none of them are an answer to the needs of the human heart. None of them can answer the problem of sin. So we confess what scripture confesses. We, as much as possible, confess it in the words that Scripture uses. But when necessary, we fall back on the words of the ancient creeds because the, our, the Church Fathers had to fight these same battles. And they very carefully and narrowly defined their terms with reference to Scripture. So when they said three persons, they knew what they meant, and their enemies would know what they meant if they would listen. Uh, we talk about one essence. We know what that means because the church has defined it very carefully in terms of scripture. We don't simply, we're not borrowing Greek metaphysics and, and in a blind fashion, just using buzzwords. 
to confuse people. We're trying as best we can to answer unbelief with both the words of Scripture and with words that challenge the unbeliever. Because the unbeliever, here is a story from my past. Well, I was a teenager, I guess. Nice Jehovah's Witness lady came to the door. And I knew immediately who she was, if only from the fact that there were two people there. They were women. They were dressed nicely. And they had a magazine under their arm. <laughs> uh, and we began a conversation. I said, wait, before we go anywhere, um, the point that's going to divide us is Jesus Christ. Can you tell me, please, according to your understanding, who Jesus is? She said, oh, that's easy. He's the Son of God, the Son of Man, the only begotten of the Father, wonderful counselor. Um, the express image of God, the firstborn of all creation. And she went on like that. I said, stop. Is he Jehovah? Oh, no. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, you, she was quoting scripture. I was applying mm -hmm. scripture. That was the tactic of the Unitarians in the uh, 19th century. You, mm -hmm. you know, we're replacing all these references to the Trinity in our liturgy with actual Bible verses. See how much more biblical we are. We're yes. not relying on creeds. We are looking to the Bible. Yes. Like, well, if you read the whole Bible <laughs> together, we can talk about this. Yeah, but the problem at that point is then you are left quoting the entire Bible every time you want to have a conversation <laughs> right. without yeah. without nuancing your voice at all, just quoting back and forth, and um, you you got word magic going on. That's not an argument. An argument is to recast statements in your words that apply mm -hmm. to the circumstances at hand while yet retaining the meaning of their original context. For instance, if I say... Uh, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Or if I say, the only begotten Son of God took to himself a true human nature. The first is scripture. The second isn't, but it's true. It's true if the first is true. If scripture means what it says, the word became flesh, then the, the second version, the Son of God took to himself a true human nature, is necessarily true. But, to say, but, but it's not the very word of God. Aren't the very words of God more important? as our foundation, to be sure. But in the middle of battle, you mm -hmm. have to speak to the words the enemy is using. Now, if the enemy will not, if the enemy will stop using human words, see, that, that's the thing. You're just using human words. Okay, we will now both stop using human words. <laughs> hear, the not, hear the silence, because what's the enemy doing? Using human words. We just don't notice it because we're naive. But when he begins to say anything, ask anything, without actually using the very text of Scripture, then he's brought in human words, and by his own standards. We may not listen to him, because they're merely human words. So, creeds. We'll talk about creeds another day. We really should just devote an entire discussion to creeds and confessions. Mm -hmm. But for now, we will fall back on the words of the ancient creeds, and say that we confess one God in unity, one God and Trinity, Trinity and unity, neither dividing the essence nor confounding the persons. We do not divide the essence, the being of God, who God is, into three parts or more. Nor do we say that the three persons are somehow the same person, either because of a change in name, a change in office, or because one has evolved into the other. Uh, if we want to reference scripture a little more closely, we can think of uh, Jesus speaking of his love for the Father and the Father's love for him. We can think of the Jesus first, I mean, uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 17, is full of these kind of things where Jesus is talking to his Father and he's not got schizophrenia or multiple uh, personality disorder. He's perfectly sane. He's talking to the Father as someone who is not, in, in, in one sense, is not him and who has made him promises, and who, who loves him, and intends to glorify him, and he in turn tends to glorify the Father, because he loves the Father. There's distinction here, and yet by now, through 4,000 years of Old Testament history, we know but there's only one God. And at some point, we stop and say, how does this work? And it's always fun to watch the, the faces of teenagers when they finally understand what they've been told all their lives. I don't get this just blew my mind. Good. That means you've got it as well as you're probably going to. We say what scripture says, we make the distinction scripture makes, we affirm the truths of scripture, and to some extent we can see how it fits together, but the whole picture, no, there is much there we do not understand. 
And anytime we say, well, wait, yeah, it's just like, no, it's not just like anything. Uh, since creation is God's handiwork, we should expect to see a great deal of three and oneness on a created level. Three primary colors, positive, negative, and neutral charges in atoms, length, breadth, and height in dimensions, past, present, and future. Oh, there's all kinds of three in oneness as triads within creation, but none of them are what God is because none of them are personal, and in no one of them is is one dimension or part wholly exhaustive of the other. When we say that Jesus is God, we don't mean he's a part of God. We mean that he possesses the fullness of the divine essence. All the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily in Christ, Paul tells us in Colossians. And the same is true of the other two persons. We, we come to Jesus and we come to God. And yet it is also true that the Son is not the Father, and the Father is not the Son, the Father is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Son, and so on. And the traditional distinctions uh, described in the Athanasian Creed and confirmed in the Westminster Confession and elsewhere are that the Father is of none, neither created nor begotten. The Son is of the Father alone, uh, not created but begotten. And the Holy Spirit is of the Father and of the Son, neither created nor begotten, but proceeding or spirated or breathed forth. Uh, and it's by these personal properties that we distinguish the three persons. And so the, the diversity, the distinction within the unity is real, but so is the unity. And it's that marvelous, incredible, ineffable thing, person, reality, that lies at the foundation of all of everything else, at the foundation of education, culture, society, civilization. And that's where we could, and probably at some point we'll have, uh, a good a good discussion of the doctrine of the one and the many, or the philosophical problem of the one and the many. But for now, let's just say that because there is one God, there is a unity to all of learning and knowledge. But because this God is three, and he is as truly three as he is one, there's also a real diversity within the things he's made. And nothing is going to be exactly like anything else. Um, there's a basis for a sort of equality, and yet there is also the reality that nothing is exactly equal because nothing can be the same. Uh, even the Father's not the Son, and although they are equal in power, majesty, glory, because they're the same God, yet there is a true distinction and diversity, and that's a wonderful good thing. Uh, the Son does not chafe at being the image of the Father. He delights in it, and the Father delights in him. And there's some good discussion we can have there about the pagan myths of how sons always rebel against their fathers, and there's some <laughs> eschatological implications there. So, anyway. so this is setting us up, I think, eventually, maybe next time, for talking about how this triune God created the world. Uh, he created out of nothing, or into nothing. There was nothing. Nothing is not something. God did not grab a bunch of nothing and then um, make it something by divine power and then build. You know, we're, we're, sometimes we're tempted to that. We look further and further into the atom and all we find is empty space. And some uh, philosophers and scientists have gone so far as almost to say, it's just, it's whirling energy and energy is nothing. So the universe is, no, they're, they're, they're stuff. <laughs> they're stuff. But we, uh, as you've said, we begin to, uh, to lose ourselves when we can't comprehend the depth of the universe. But once we understand that we don't get God, we should not be terribly surprised that we didn't get all the universe. But when we understand that God, who communicates with self-revealing, he reveals himself in his Son, the Father and Son reveal themselves through the Spirit to one another. This is a self-revealing God. He reveals himself in creation, and though he is hidden, he's not hidden. He's hidden and revealed at the same time, according to his good pleasure. And so as we come to this, this colorful world, of a million tones and textures, uh, we're not overwhelmed. There is unity. The good God who we love, who is our Father in heaven, made it for us with purposes in mind, and yet we don't lose the particularity. Every This rose is important. This girl is important. This county is important. This book, this word in this book is important. We can look at the details and say, this is important. God made it. God put it here. It plays, has a place in God's eternal plan. And 
we see that God created uh, without competition, but in perfect harmony and perfect love, the three persons working together, we have at the, at the beginning of all things, we have eternal love, eternal fellowship, eternal communion, eternal language, eternal knowledge, eternal personality. And that's something the world needs right now. In this post-postmodern world, we're told that the one thing that this generation wants is communion, community, ability to reach out and touch someone. <laughs> the gospel offers that if we will tell it right, but we do need to learn to speak the language of this generation and not brush it off because they're not to our taste. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what a comfort is there in that that God is self-revealing. Like I had a conversation once in college around the cafeteria table about how, you know, if God is so holy and ineffable, any words we use to describe him, even the words of the Bible are going to be insufficient. It's like, no, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> you know, if we believe this is the word of God, that he has chosen these words to communicate to us, that communication is possible. I love C.S. Lewis's analogy that, you know, if William Shakespeare is going to appear in a play, you know that it was William Shakespeare who put himself into the play. Mm -hmm. Like it's the, the actor's the characters cannot call him forth onto the stage. It's his will to be revealed. Um, and that we can know things, you know, that the world is, we can say at once, has this cohesion and this unity and this diversity, and yet we can still make sense of it. It's not ultimately one or the other, it's both. And that means that knowledge is possible, that we can make distinctions and have relative clarity in conversations. I think that's just wonderful. Relative clarity, um, substantial communication, I think Schaefer might say. A and the world will tell us, no, that's not it. There must be exact correspondence. I must know exactly what you know the way you know it. But you know, in reality, that's not the way it functions. Francis Schaefer used to give the example of uh, tea. He was sitting down with a young university student who wanted to discuss grand, grand realities. Um, epistemology and such. And, and, and the conversation kept dead ending. The young man would say to Schaefer, ah, sir, I do not believe we are communicating. But as Schaefer is getting frustrated, he noticed that the young man had taken a great deal of trouble to provide a tea for them both, a very nice tea service with the, not just the tea, but the, the biscuits and whatever else goes with traditional English tea. And as, as the man says, the young man says again, sir, I do not believe we are communicating. Schaefer said, give me some tea. And the young man will take him back, oh, yes, sir, and, and poured it and put, put it in front of him. And Schaefer looked at him and spoke and said, sir, I believe we are communicating. <laughs> um, and then Schaefer points to his own experience with tea and then to his wife, who apparently, his wife, I think, grew up in China, I think, as a missionary child. Uh, they both brought very different backgrounds to the concept of tea. And mine would be very different again and probably yours. And yet we can both point at the thing and say T, and our reference point is not in the long run, even our own experiences as they play into it, but ultimately the confidence that we have together that our Heavenly Father made it for us, put it here, and has purposes for it. And even if we do not understand it, say, the, the molecular formula, or how this particular kind of tea got here and how it differs in every respect to that tea over there, Nonetheless, communication is actually possible. It can be substantially true without being exhaustively true. God can tell us things that are true about mm -hmm. himself that do not exhaust who he is. Deuteronomy 29.29, the uh, secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but the things which he has revealed belong to us and to our children that we may do all the words of this law. There are things that God has not said, some things that honestly he can't say, things that that he can't communicate to us because we're finite. But he can communicate everything he needs to. He made us in such a way and arranged communication in such a way that everything he wants to say to us, he has said in Scripture. And we can come to Scripture with that clear confidence that although we, in one sense, will never exhaust it, it's clear. And as Mark Twain once said, it's not the parts of uh, Scripture I don't understand that bother me. It's the parts I do understand. You know, how, how hard is thou shalt not commit adultery? I ask my students sometimes, how, how hard is it really to, to find the will of God? And they'll kind of think about that for a second. I'll say, all right, so you as a student, is it okay for you to kill? Well, no. 
How about cheat? No, of course not. Adultery? No, right out. Uh, get drunk? No. Uh, back talk your mom? No. Seems like God's will's pretty easy and straightforward, don't you think? <laughs> it's the things that God is clear about that make the unbeliever uncomfortable. Because for 2,000 years, the church really has pretty much agreed about most things. Uh, we, we, we believe in a God who made the world in six days. We believe that he's triune. We believe that Jesus Christ is God incarnate. We believe that he died for sinners. We believe the morality expressed in the Ninth Commandments is something that God still cares about. We believe that Jesus is coming back someday to judge the world. We believe in the resurrection. The basics of Christianity are, are not up for grabs. The scripture is clear, but that doesn't mean that, that any of us have learned everything scripture has to say. And, and, and that in turn means that we as a community, as the church, can grow in understanding of scripture. As the centuries and the millennia passed, we can look at, say, the Westminster Confession, the Westminster Standards more broadly, and compare them to the Apostles' Creed and say, this is improvement. Uh, the Church Fathers did not understand all of these things as clearly. And we can hope that in 2,000 years, if the Lord tarries, that the Church will look back and say, hey, guys, really appreciate what you did back there, but there was some stuff you completely missed because, look, the Bible, look what it says. <laughs> and we in heaven will say, oops. <laughs> At that point, we probably already know what we missed. So, yeah, communication, clarity, substantial. There was another word you used. I forget what you said. Um, substantial understanding without being exhaustive and yet being real. We, we can offer this to the world. We have a solid foundation for knowing what truth is. And it doesn't require us to know everything. It doesn't eliminate the possibility of science, of learning, of education, of growing in knowledge and truth. But it does give us a firm foundation, as, as Deuteronomy says, to do all the words of this law. God has told us what we need to do, know in order to obey him, and to trust in him and to walk before him. And that's what we need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. Well, I think that's all the time we have for today. So thank you so much, Greg, for this conversation. Thanks to David, our producer, and my lawful wedded husband. Uh, thanks to all y'all who are listening. Uh, hope you can join us next time on Halting Towards Zion. Thank you.